Before we get started, let's make two things clear. One, despite the claims from early rumors and recent reviews, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle is most definitely a sequel to the original film from 1995. It makes sure to clarify that in the very first scene. And two, the movie managed to make more money at the box office than Justice League, and it hadn't even been released in China at this point. So in other words, more people went to see a movie starring Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart than they did Batman and Superman. May that forever haunt Warner Brothers and be a permanent reminder as to how much they screwed up. Anyway, I was always curious to see a Jumanji movie actually set in the horrific jungle, and now we have one. But which one is superior, the original or the sequel? We're about to find out. Let the battle commence. Jumanji opens with a young boy called Alan Parrish. On his way to his father's shoe shop, he gets chased by some bullies. Rather than running away, he decides to take his father's advice and stand up to them. As soon as he is about to make his way home, he hears a mysterious drumming sound. He follows it and finds it was coming from a board game called Jumanji. He takes it home, and upon showcasing his newly found confidence with the bullies, his father decides that he's ready to go to boarding school. However, Alan is opposed to the idea, much to the dismay of his father. After the two get involved in a heated argument, Alan decides to run away from home, however, just when he is about to leave the house, he gets an unexpected visitor from his friend, Sarah. He invites her in, and together they inspect the mysterious game he found earlier. They unintentionally end up rolling the dice and take their first move. Sarah's move causes a horrific screeching sound to suddenly appear in the fireplace, and Alan's sucks him into the actual game itself. Immediately after, a bunch of bats all come out of the fireplace and chase Sarah out of the house. We are then, via a seamless transition, taken 26 years later where the house is for sale and we have a new family that moves in. Two kids called Judy and Peter and their aunt Nora. Almost immediately, the two start to hear the same mysterious drumming sounds and one day they rush to find where it's coming from. And wouldn't you know it, they both end up finding the insidious board game. Just like the kids before them, they inspect it and each roll the dice. After taking a couple turns, they end up releasing Alan from his 26 year entrapment. Despite being understandably reluctant, he agrees to help and moderate Judy and Peter's playthrough of the game. However, despite taking multiple attempts, the game suddenly refuses to work. Upon further inspection, Alan realizes that Judy and Peter are both playing the same game that he and his childhood friend Sarah started 26 years ago. And consequentially, it's not only Alan that needs to continue playing, but Sarah needs to participate as well. They eventually find her, and it's from this point in the movie we have all our main characters together, and they strive to complete the game and rid the world of the creatures it has unleashed. So you can clearly see that the story of Jumanji has a lot of character introductions to it, and it only gets better and more rich once they get fully developed. And whilst everything is going on, I do like how in the background the movie is practically setting up the rise of the Planet of the Apes. So, that's the story for the first movie. What's the story for the second film? Four school kids all get detention. As they go through their punishment, they rather conveniently find a games console in the same room they're having detention, which they decide to hook up to pass the time. After they choose their characters, the game sucks them in, providing a whole new meaning to virtual reality. And it just so happens that the kids are reincarnated inside the bodies of the characters they chose to play as. And from here, they have to play by the game's rules and finish it to completion in order to survive and return home. So yeah, the story is more simplified and streamlined in Jumanji 2. What was really interesting about the story in the first Jumanji is that it feels like a story that consists of character arcs. Alan, Sarah, Judy, Peter, Alan's parents, and even Carl the Shoemaker are all given their own stories, and the way in which it does this is really quite seamless. I mean, Alan's parents are hardly in the movie, but the film does a great job of setting them up and telling you what they were going through when Alan was trapped in the jungle. And seeing as the story is being told in two different time periods, you are really able to read into a lot of things and fill in the gaps as to what happened when Alan was away. In the sequel, on the other hand, you can't really read into anything or come up with any interesting commentaries. It falls under one of those cases of, what you see is what you get, and that makes it very light on the storytelling front. More than anything, it's really used as an excuse to put characters like Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart together and have them pick on one another, rather than using it to help and fully develop their characters. So due to the missed opportunity and overly simplified nature of the narrative in Jumanji 2, the movie with a superior story is the 1995 movie. Now when we see Alan as a kid, he doesn't have a great amount of development, but he has just enough to where you sympathise with him and the movie does a good job of getting you to understand where he's coming from. You also get tons of development for the parents. When Alan returns home after disappearing for 26 years, he quite depressingly discovers how much emotional suffering they had to go through. As well as being really touching and heartfelt, you genuinely feel bad for them. And that sentiment is carried through to Alan, and you can see the pain and sadness in his eyes as he figures all of this out. Additionally, the town started to spread horrible rumours that Alan's father cut him up into pieces and hid them in the house. The movie really pulls no punches with the consequences of Alan's disappearance, and it handles it very realistically. 
And it doesn't stop there. It turns out it also had an impact on the only witness that was there at the time. And this swiftly moves us on to our next character, Sarah. As well as the parents, she also had to deal with rumours by not just kids, but the whole town who thought she was mental for stating that Alan disappeared by getting sucked into a board game. One thing they never talked about though is what Alan's parents made of this. Did they take her seriously? Did they ever think to give the game a go? Anyway, next up we also have Judy and Peter, and they are a good couple of kid characters for younger viewers to relate to. Additionally, it increases the stakes and tension of the movie and it also gives the adult characters someone to look after and showcase sentimentality towards. And ultimately, if it wasn't for them, then Alan would not have escaped from the jungle and the game wouldn't be beat. And finally, I've saved the best till last. Let's talk about Robin Williams' portrayal as adult Alan. Now Robin Williams is very reserved in his performance here. Usually when he plays a serious character, he will always find an opportunity to play it up or utilise his comedic talents. The primary example of this being Hook and Mrs Doubtfire. But this is pretty much, to my knowledge, the only kids movie where he plays it straight from beginning to end. And that's very refreshing to see coming from him. Also, Robin Williams has proved time and time again that he is a great emotional actor, and the same can be said for his performance in this movie. So overall, Robin Williams did a fantastic job in this film. Now as for the characters in Jumanji 2, the movie portrays them as typical teenagers, but sadly their personalities are very light, and as a result, they just come off as flat and uninteresting. Now that being said, I surprisingly ended up liking the kid characters. They weren't good, but they were passable. Now it's time to talk about the characters that are the main stars of the show. How were their adult counterparts in the movie? Well, Ruby Roundhouse here was just okay. Acting-wise, there was nothing that set her apart from the rest of the group. She had a surprisingly decent choreographed fight sequence, which was good, but then she had a couple of scenes that were an attempt at comedy, but ultimately they ended up being awkward. I honestly think she is probably the most forgettable character out of the entire group. Then we have Kevin Hart, and I tell ya, one of the weaknesses on his stats list should have been talking, because out of all the characters, he is the most obnoxious and is just rehashing the exact same shtick he's done in his other movies, albeit in a PG-13 fashion. Ultimately, I can sum up Kevin Hart in the exact same way I have his other films. When he's doing stand-up, he's hilarious, but when he's in a movie, he is just flat-out annoying and lacks diversity. Now the two that were easily the best of the group was Jack Black and Dwayne Johnson's characters. Jack Black's performance in particular was bloody amazing. As strange as it is to say, he fully embraced and embodied the mannerisms and body language of a young girl and he is really good. As a matter of fact, he is too good. He channels a young girl so well that when the script ends up having him hit on a much younger male character, you are aware that it's a 16 year old girl that is doing the flirting but we, the audience, just see grown-up Jack Black hitting on a teenage boy. Regardless, on performance alone, I give Jack Black a 10 out of 10. He was that good. And finally, the one you have all been waiting for, it's time to talk about The Rock himself, Dwayne Johnson. Now what makes him funny is that every other movie plays him up to be the confident muscle man who can stand up to anything, and in this movie, he is a big muscle man who can stand up to nothing, because he is essentially a big sissy in this movie, and watching him be afraid of things such as a spider and at once even a little fluffy animal was awesome. My only complaint is that we didn't see enough of it. This means instead of coming off as a fully realised character trait, it just comes off as a couple extra jokes the movie decided to incorporate. So yeah, Dwayne Johnson is good, but unlike Jack Black, his character trait was not seamlessly integrated into his personality. So of the two movies, which one had the better characters? Well, again, I think that goes to the first movie. They just feel more real, interesting, and come across like three-dimensional characters that you actually care for and want to see come out of this alive. In Jumanji 2, the characters were decent, but I didn't care if any of them died or not. And unfortunately, that kind of makes them disposable. So yeah, the movie with the superior characters is the first Jumanji. Now the obstacle for our main characters is whatever creatures Jumanji throws at them. But before we talk about that, let's talk about how both movies handled their transference into the game. Now in Jumanji 2, when they get transferred into the game, it is not the least bit frightening, and the music does little to add to the urgency of the scene. In the original, on the other hand, it was brutal, unnerving, and genuinely creepy. Now the scare factor is significantly reduced when you watch it nowadays, as this effect looks quite cheap for today's standard, but when combined with Alan's painful screams, the brutality still comes through surprisingly well. Add to that, the very idea of Alan being trapped in the jungle with all of the animals and creatures we see later on is horrendously unnerving. 
Also, it definitely helps that the creatures in Jumanji were based on real animals. Now granted, they were exaggerated, but honestly, that always just made them seem scarier to me. The jungle is a very mysterious place and we'd most likely die before even witnessing a tenth of its population. So to illustrate that, the game pulled some enhanced creatures out of this mysterious jungle and the very idea of going up against these things is genuinely terrifying. And unbelievably, the movie takes it a step further. Pretty much every single scene where the animals come out of the game, there is a unique and intense soundtrack that builds up for each and every single one of them. First it slowly draws in your curiosity, then it draws on your fear for these characters, until finally you see the creatures and then it comes down to a game of survival. And on a side note, have you noticed how much of an asshole Jumanji is to Alan? When he's a kid, he takes his first turn and it sucks him into its twisted jungle. When he's an adult and he works up the courage to take his first dice roll after 26 years, it unleashes a hunter on him that he clearly has history with, and in his next turn, it tries to bury him in quicksand. If he didn't win with his fourth roll, I wonder what else it would have unleashed on him. Anyway, now it's time to talk about the jungle in Jumanji 2. Now there is a scene in the first movie where Alan tells Judy and Peter what a scary place Jumanji's jungle is, and he describes it in detail. You think monkeys, mosquitoes, and lions are bad? That's just the beginning. I've seen things you've only seen in your nightmares. Things you can't even imagine. Something screams, then you hear them eating, and you hope to God that you're not deserted. Afraid? You don't even know what afraid is. You will not last five minutes without me. When I heard this as a kid, I was blown away. Clearly that is the horrifying feeling we should get from the jungle. And what does Jumanji 2 do? Welcome to the jungle! Get out of here, Ike. You're too young for this stuff. Bullshit. What's she doing now? Ah! <laughs> Click it off, dude. Click it off. Dude, what the fuck is wrong with German people? Yeah, I'll talk about this movie on its own merits in a minute, but let's first talk about the elephant in the room, the huge wasted opportunity from a greatly set up concept. As you just heard, the jungle is a terrifying place and the original movie did a great job of illustrating that with the animals and enhanced wildlife that came out of the game, but the sequel decided to tackle it from a comedic point of view. And this brings us to the popular question. If you're going to completely abandon the tone and style of the first movie, why even bother making a sequel and calling it Jumanji? Seriously, if you just took the Jumanji name out of the movie and kept everything else the same, you wouldn't even know this is related to the original film. That's how disconnected this sequel feels from the world that the first movie sets up. Additionally, when I watched the original as a kid, I used to wonder, what other creatures could be living in the jungle? If they are this much trouble in small numbers, imagine what kind of threat they would be in their own environment. Just the mere idea of it is very terrifying. Well, Jumanji 2, however, decides to take that terrifying idea of evolved animals roaming the jungle and replaces it with people on motorbikes. I mean, this movie's title is called Welcome to the Jungle. By jungle, I didn't think they would mean a jungle full of humans. Your natural inclination would be animals. Even the marketing confirms this for you with the trailer and even the poster. Heck, even the crocodile that makes it into the poster doesn't even show up in the movie. At the very least, I really would have liked and appreciated if they incorporated some of the creatures from the first movie. Just to see their natural habitat would have made for some genuinely threatening and suspenseful scenes as well as serving as effective fan service for dedicated viewers of the original. As after all, this does take place in that very same jungle. <sighs> anyway, now that that's all said and done, let's talk about this jungle on its own merits. In Jumanji 2, the game incorporates some new rules for its world which provide some definite stakes for our characters as it means they must abide by them or die. It also has a unique list of abilities, strengths, weaknesses, and limitations for each of them which all come into play at one time or another. So that's good. Again, what's not so good is that the movie also has a crappy villain and I find that to be completely pointless. It's just including another human. The jungle is a threat enough, but including so many people takes away the isolation element and makes the island infinitely less intimidating and scary. But in typical Hollywood fashion, a big bad guy must be shoehorned into the movie. And yeah, he is just a complete waste of space. So I was expecting this round to easily go to the second movie, as having to survive in the world of Jumanji is an ingenious idea. But unfortunately, the jungle hardly feels like a threat. Not to mention, you only see four different types of animals in this two-hour movie. I am not kidding. And going up against a bunch of faceless thugs with a very limited IQ absolutely pales in comparison to the creatures that the first movie conjured up. So the movie that utilized the Jumanji game the most effectively is the first movie. 
The first Jumanji is a film that takes its young audience seriously and treats them like adults. For many of us, it was our first venture into the horror genre. But to offset this, it did have its comedic moments too, and they weren't just full of people shouting indecencies. It would also take the time to incorporate much more quiet and calm character moments all the whilst combining them with a lot of heart. Jumanji 2 throws all that out for, you guessed it, comedy. Or as I like to call it, Hollywood's safe zone. Now to me, where the comedy works is whenever it mocks the overly sophisticated and unrealistic rules of certain video games or showcases the cliched characteristics of some of the kids. And as I mentioned earlier, Jack Black and Dwayne Johnson are also utilised very effectively in several of their comedic scenes. Now as for sad scenes, the film has two, and they are more like moments, as they are only given about 20 seconds to a minute. In stark contrast, the original had an emotional scene that went on for a really solid five minutes where Alan returns from his entrapment in the jungle and is searching for his parents whilst he simultaneously takes in how different his hometown has become. It was a really good scene, and it became increasingly more emotional as it went on. And that's what's surprisingly good about the first Jumanji. It would find opportunities to include some sad moments that are actually connected to the story, and as well as giving it the perfect amount of time to play out through body language and facial expressions, the music would come in and enrich the moments with the exact emotion the scene is meant to encapsulate. And this brings us to the music for Jumanji. It picks a theme and is in keeping with it, but it's not afraid to branch out with different moods, and that drastically enhances the already established tone that the movie sets up. Despite the implausible subject matter, the composer, James Horner, took his job very seriously and put in so much effort into composing the soundtrack, and it shows. It's a score that consists of emotion, mystery, action, and horror, and it has an amazing ability of captivating you and pulling you into this world. So in comparison, how is the music in Jumanji 2? Well, the first warning sign is that it is composed by Henry Jackman, and if you have seen my Kong Skull Island vs video, then you'll know exactly what my thoughts are on his compositions. And I still stand by what I said. Jackman's music is lazy and unbelievably generic. This immediately becomes apparent when at the beginning of the movie, the music depicts the game as being really whimsical when in actuality it should be terrifying, or at the very least mysteriously atmospheric. But this movie doesn't have the talent nor the skill to intuitively pull this off. Even during its action and dramatic moments, the music does nothing to tonally or emotionally complement the scenes. <sighs> what really bothers me about this is that Henry Jackman, when he wants to, is genuinely talented and can create a really good soundtrack. He has proven this time and time again with his scores for X-Men First Class, Uncharted 4, and a couple pieces from Captain America Civil War. But when he's cutting corners and wants to get something done quick, you can really tell, and the end result is unimaginative, uninspired, and criminally generic. Now, with regards to comedy, the first movie integrates it as a means to lighten the tone and keep the overall horror atmosphere in line with a more family-friendly genre. It's never used as a crutch. The second movie, however, relies on comedy as its primary tone, and it pretty much sticks with it from beginning to end. It never tries to branch out and incorporate some risk-taking with its tone like the first movie did. It's just comedy and action. And the comedy at times can be funny, particularly with Dwayne Johnson and Jack Black, but other than that, the comedy from everyone else is just standard. Also, horror is something that should be in this movie by default, as the first film clearly illustrated that these creatures are no joke and are very dangerous. Despite this, however, the second film decides to completely ignore this, and although it sometimes shows the extent of how dangerous they can be, the brutality just isn't there and the tension is being directed at the exaggerated action element, rather than making these animals come across as horrendous mutated freaks of nature. Now, it's worth noting that the comedy for the first Jumanji doesn't always hit either. There are a couple scenes where they tell a joke that isn't cringeworthy, but it's just not funny. The worst one is this. I honestly think this is one of the dumbest scenes in movie history. Seriously, who the hell wrote this? If anything, it's like this is foreshadowing how useless Kirsten Dunst is going to be as Mary Jane in the upcoming Spider-Man movies. So tonally, the first Jumanji tried something that was different and challenging. It's one of those very rare occasions where the PG rating is pushed to its limits and it leaves the realms of a kid's movie and becomes more of a horror movie. Jumanji 2 attempts a more conventional tone of comedy and action, and coming off of the first Jumanji, this is very uncreative and downright tired. So the movie with a superior tone by far is the first movie. Look, I know the original Jumanji isn't perfect, some of the CG effects aren't great anymore, good god the monkeys look like crap, and Alan's father telling him that he doesn't have to go to boarding school despite having generations of family that did go is very inaccurate to how the elder generation treats long-standing family traditions. But, much like another two of Sony's movies, the new one just makes you appreciate the original even more, and the amount of good stuff the original Jumanji did far outweighs the bad. 
Honest to God, I went into this movie with the intentions of giving it plenty of leeway, and even though it did surpass my expectations, it still ended up being a below average movie that had all the potential to be great and different, but ended up being a generic comedy instead. It's time for the scores. Jumanji gets an 8 out of 10, and Jumanji 2 gets a below average 4 out of 10. It's just disposable. It didn't push any boundaries, it didn't do anything to complement its source material, and all around, it is just flat out forgettable. Now if this movie stood on its own, then I would give it some leeway, but it doesn't stand on its own. It's a sequel, and if you don't want to be compared to a well-known and established property, then you don't associate yourself with it. Now for all my criticisms, the movie isn't as bad as I thought it would be, and if it was completely disconnected from Jumanji, then I would give it a slightly better rating and be more lenient, but when a studio tries to make a sequel to an already existing and popular property, then it is going to be judged as such. So I hope that with the inevitable sequel Jumanji 2 gets, Sony will try to inject some more creativity and take risks with the concept and tone. But this is Sony we are talking about, and when it comes to creativity, they have showcased a great deal of ineptitude on that front. So, that concludes another Versus video. Sorry it took so long, guys. The next one won't take anywhere near as much time, I promise. As always, if you like the video, please do give it a thumbs up as it genuinely does help. And also, if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe to my channel for more Versus videos. It's free for you and good for me. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I will catch all of you next time. Take care.